Hello, Karen. Hello. How are you? Great. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, where Where are you located in the U.S.? I'm in New York. Fantastic, New York. So we have about six hours difference. I'm in France, and I'm thrilled to be talking about your your book and your message. Um, you because you have a very interesting background. You come from the business background and you had this MBA and were a businesswoman. And all of a sudden, after 9-11, from my understanding, you got uh, very intuitive all of a sudden. And yes. I know a lot of women and men, actually, but a lot of women can recognize themselves uh, in, in your in your very in, in your, you know, in your in your. How do you say this? Parcours. It comes. The word comes in French. <laughs> <laughs> but in your journey, I guess. Uh, yeah. So how did it felt when you first kind of heard or felt or saw your first intuition? How did they came about? Well, what, what happened at, at that time in, in um, 2001, I was working as an independent business consultant. So I was working out of my home and I would run a few mornings a week, three or four mornings a week before I started my day. And on the morning of 9-11... I had come back from my run and I was punching the key code in to get the garage door to go up and then I experienced the attack on the World Trade Center. But even though I'm in New York, I, I'm not close enough to uh, Manhattan. I'm outside in the suburbs of Manhattan. So I didn't have any physical clues or any evidence or earthly evidence of what was happening. I just thought that whatever was going on in my mind's eye or in my knowledge, I thought it was just a very bad way to think. And I admonished myself. But within a minute or so, I had someone ringing my phone telling me to put the television on. And I saw that the broadcasters were making suppositions about a small plane getting off target. But then when I saw what was happening, I instantaneously knew that what had happened to me in the driveway a moment earlier was that I was experiencing the attack as it was occurring. But I also had knowledge with it. I knew it was a terrorist attack. I knew that it was just beginning. So it was almost as though it was the first time in my life I discovered that your conscious energy is not connected to your body. And it's a it's a very interesting discovery. And once you discover it, you can't unknow that because you can't make something like that up. Do you mean you were you 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 know now that you're connected to this uh, field? of consciousness right yes. and then on that day you kind of had your you tapped in that yes that's exactly right um, and what I think what made my journey more profound was that I was raised in a family that had no spiritual belief system so I didn't even have a language for things that maybe other people found to be common but for me it was always about intelligence and the intellect and academic achievement so for my stumbling into a whole different perspective was much more eye-opening than if perhaps I had been guided into that direction or had this belief that there's a collective conscious energy or that we are not our bodies or that we are all one or that we are eternal even. And not having any basis for that, it was almost as though science was live proving to me that my ideas that came from logic were false and you can't unprove that and that that's what made the journey really fascinating for me you you, you called it and i read that you called it or somebody called it accidental enlightenment <laughs> how um I, I, there's a few questions of course were you able to reproduce that quickly after that and have you been able to receive some information from or from that point of point on you were just receiving information randomly and you kind of had to fine tune and choose your moments also because it could be quite daunting if it suddenly happens to you yeah yeah and for a while after 9-11 you know being someone who lives in New York there was there was a lot to be done that had nothing to do with my experience there was a long recovery uh, we helped a lot of people for a long time after that. So I didn't really share my story with that many people because it was insignificant in comparison to what was happening in the world. But over time, when I relaxed again, that's when I started to receive simultaneous information about things that were happening all over the world. But what was even more interesting was that I also started to have, it felt like the 
ticker going across the bottom of a news program, I was having like a narrator explain to me why the things were happening. And not from a physical perspective, like this crisis occurred or this challenge happened physically. I would get that in my mind's eye. But I was hearing the reasons behind people intersecting, behind weather challenges about certain regions and what they were feeling or their collective angst and how these opportunities were providing benefit for humanity to rediscover some of the things that they had forgotten. Yeah, like that. Where? How? Uh, what was that voice? Who was it? How do you well, define? Is it channeling? Is it channeling? Is it you connecting? Is it a group of souls? Is it God? Is it? In it is. I guess I didn't even know what channeling was at the time, but now I understand that it is channeling. So it's. I call it. It's. I'm connecting with a non-physical source. So the non-physical source at that time was one particular soul that was not living in a physical body. But now I can collect to the consciousness of, of all souls or whatever souls are wanting to aggregately connect with me in any given moment. Have you ever had uh, negative connections like with souls that were not there for the light and the love? No, and, and in my journey, because I have always taken a scientific approach to this, having evidence that I felt was viable and proving what it is that I received through this conduit was really important to me. I wouldn't come forward and give information to other people unless I had validated it with my for myself. One of the things that I've become pretty clear on is that there really is no such thing as evil or negativity when we're not in human form. Uh, so as soon as we cross over or we return to our soul conscious state, there's no negative. All there is is unconditional love and brilliance and bliss, ecstasy, a full cognition of our journey here on earth, what pieces of the puzzle we're trying to pick up for ourselves and for the collective. So there's not even a risk of bringing in negative energy. Um, since I have an opportunity to, to, I've spoken with thousands and thousands of clients now and audiences, every time someone brings me a story that indicates that they connected with something that could be potentially harmful, I'm able to intuit how something in their journey, their own personal bias, skewed what really happened and that there really was no negative energy on the other side. And that's an important piece of knowledge for us to know. So that we're not afraid to connect with what is only goodness. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I have done hundreds and hundreds of interviews on, on the changes, on the paradigm shifts, on all of that. What is your um, perception? What is the information you receive about what we're going through right now as of March 2013, several months after this, this very famous 21 uh, yes. December 2012? Right. Um, I, I was never one that believed in anything that sounded too woo-woo. So I actually did a seminar last year at the beginning of 2012. And I, I just said, let's talk about the energy of 2012. So for three hours, I stood there and opened up the conduit and listened to what souls had to say about it. And everything that they're stating is really optimistic. Um, number one, if you look at the end of the Mayan calendar, yes, it's the end of the world, but it's the end of the world as we know it. So what it is, it's stepping into a new era. It's stepping into an age where there'll be more people who are living above the line, more people who are, are connecting with joy, connecting with the essence of themselves, connecting with love as their primary resource. And once you live above the line, energetically, you're able to provide benefit to other people who are living closed or asleep. I say you're either asleep or awake to some degree. Um, but it looks as though to me that between 2012, last year, and through 2020, we'll have more people who are living above the line than we have had before. And I, and I look at it more like energy. There'll be more energy above the line than below the line. 
So if you're vibrating with intensive energy, it only takes a few of those to eclipse a lot that are living below the line. But we'll have more energy above the line probably for the first time in modern history, or at least in recorded history. And once that happens, it's like the seesaw. No matter what direction it was, more tilted toward negative, it has no choice but to shift toward the positive. So momentum toward people understanding the value of each other, the value of our collective lives, how to love themselves more, the shift will begin more rapidly and will gain momentum. Mm. And on, this, on the challenge side, what, what is there some things, some traps yes. or some things that we can, we can kind of go back to? Yes. On the, on the challenge side, what is typical, and we did see this a lot last year, is that uh, you think about it like this. If you do live below the line, and if you're complacent living at, let's say, negative 20 to negative 40, if you are complacent and you're living there a, a decade or two decades or three decades, you don't have much incentive to move higher because you're used to being where you are in a negative state. So what happens is that there'll be a lot of people that experience different circumstances that make them drop. So they'll drop to negative 40 to negative 60. And that sharpness of the new intense pain will make them feel as though it's intolerable. So they'll seek another perspective because being from negative 20 to negative 40 wasn't creating any idea that they wanted to change what they were doing or how they were seeing the universe. But dropping becomes such a difficult state of pain that now they're willing to listen to perhaps an idea that's coming from above the line that they weren't li willing to listen to previously. Uh, so as a result, there'll be uh, these very deep challenges around the world that cause people and regions to fall below the line. In our area, on the, in the Northeast of the United States last year, we did have that experience with a, a phenomenal storm that left a lot of people homeless and without property. And if I'm sure that everybody understands the, the devastation that it caused, that's an example. And it provides the potential benefit for those that are involved in the crisis. Every challenge brings multitudes of benefits. So people can say, well, I'm either going to choose to be miserable because I'm a victim and this is what happened to me, or they can choose to say, I lived, my family lived, this is just a house, this is just a basement, this is not that important in the long end and we're going to get through it because the only thing that matters is love. And these are the opportunities that will appear to help those who haven't yet shifted to have an opportunity to shift. I'm sure a lot of people come to you and, and uh, since you're an intuitive and a life coach with the question, you know, what is my purpose? And uh, I receive that a lot and I, I, I hear a lot of people asking themselves the question, what is your understanding of our purpose as human beings on the planet? And then how can we get into the specifics of it? Our purpose collectively and individually, it's very simple across the board that we are seeking to vibrate closer to the vibration of pure love. Um, we use the word love so liberally that sometimes we've lost an understanding of what the meaning of it is. But what it really is, it's the most powerful energy in the universe. You know, if you believe in a creator, it's synonymous with a creator. It's the universe. It is um, the way I, I had it explained to me actually by a non-physical source. This made a lot of sense to me. As soon as we think we know what's going on, when we found the smallest element on earth, someone cracked open that element, split the atom and found that more power was inside what we thought was nothing. So the point is we don't understand the power of love. But the power of love is what will allow the planet and all of the individuals on the planet to reharmonize. They'll, when ultimately we're living to that vibration, there'll be no war, there'll be no illness, there'll be no um, poverty and hunger. All of these things will begin to dissolve slowly. Uh, so ultimately, as every individual gets closer and closer to vibrating to the vibration of love, then collectively the ripples of that benefit will be seen in, in all different areas and all different arenas. 
And it, the natural byproduct of vibrating closer to the vibration of love is that you become happier. A lot of people even get more attractive and they become more magnetic to people around them. They find themselves in better relationships. They feel more fit. Sometimes they feel younger. Um, and, and they make choices that are coming from a place of intuition, which support them more than decisions that are coming from the intellect. And then what's interesting is that the journey becomes very unique yet very connected and not in the separation or the competition, which you must have experienced a lot in business. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. and, and one of the things that I do like to talk about is that sometimes when people hear about the collective, it makes them feel as though they are insignificant. And it, I think it's just as important that people recognize that every person is significant. Uh, and I like to see it as when looking at 2020, I mean, I'm 20, I'm sorry, 2012. Last year, the end of the Mayan calendar was 12, 21, 12. When you look at the numbers, one, two, one, two, what was indicated to me is that the significance or the metaphor of the numbers is that one is the individual, two is the collective. The fact that in that numerology, the ones and the twos appeared, but not in any particular sequence or pattern. They were a little bit more random. It was trying to demonstrate that one is as important as two and two is as important as one. So when everyone starts to understand that I am as important as everything and everything is as important as me, then we start to have more balance. The collective is not more important and you are not more important. We are equally important. Mm, beautiful. Is there any other advice or things that you would like to share with us at the time, the information you're receiving or... Uh, I think that two, 2013 is a really good year to take um, take a survey of what you do know, what your own inner knowledge is. And it's a great year to release yourself of baggage. It starts out metaphorically by cleaning out a drawer, cleaning out a closet, getting rid of things that don't serve you any longer. Um, get rid of now, let's not be hasty here, but get rid of a job if it doesn't serve you. Start to perceive that there is a an opportunity out there for you that matches your soul's intent. Um, get rid of, this sounds harsh, but get rid of the people who are no longer mutually beneficial in your life. When you clean out the things that aren't serving you anymore, you're making room for things that are more compatible with the journey that you're embarking on, and those things can come into your life. I, it's not something you can do sweepingly, which is why just cleaning out one drawer is going to get you moving into the right direction. And then one more thing, clean out, one more thing, clean out. And you do start to see rather quickly that the universe brings you things in that space that support who you are today. So I would say for people, acknowledge that you know more than you think you know. Acknowledge that you have an inner guidance and let it be what you listen to more than you listen to advice that's not making you feel comfortable. Mm. And, 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 and be with that. I, have, I think as human beings we have a tendency to, to, to let other people know about that. But as much as I, 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 I think it's important for people to be authentic and vulnerable, it's also important for those very um, subtle treasures and talents and connections to, to nurture it and to protect it and, and to really fully kind of like all the, all the cells in the body be embedded, be, be infused with that vibration and wait to be really outside and, and fully release. It's okay to, we don't have to scream it on each of the, every roof. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I completely agree. I like, I like your statement. It's a great statement. It, it means follow your own curiosity, follow your own passion, do what you're interested in. Don't make your to-do list more important than living. Exactly right. If everyone were to live to their essence and to their own joy, that alone would make the, the painting of our earthly canvas more beautiful. You're right. Mm, beautiful. So you, you wrote several books. Huh? Could you remind us of those? The titles uh, of your book? It's, it's a series of books. The first is called The Answers to Your Questions About Life. And it's designed to 
help you strip away the misbeliefs that you have picked up on earth. We all pick up misbeliefs because we are surrounded by them. Simple things like it, life is hard or um, money doesn't grow on trees or if you go outside with wet hair, you'll get a pneumonia. Um, that, that book is basically to help you question, question, question everything that you see and feel and think. The next book is called Begin Here. And I love I love this book. It's a book where it brings you back to the state of self love that you were born with. No matter how much you love yourself when you begin the book, by the time you finish, you love yourself more. And the third book is called Money Wisdom, and it actually just was released this week. And that's designed to help people who have a relationship with scarcity and they're not feeling prosperous to change their relationship with the material world into one of abundance. Mm. I would just like to dig a little bit into that. Tell us about your perception on money and on abundance. What are the, some of the main lessons in it? The main, the main concept behind it is that we have to remember that everything in life is metaphoric here. This is, this is a play. This is a script. We're watching a movie and we, we believe our own role in the movie. And as everything is metaphoric, money is a metaphor for the expression of love. We use it as a way to give love and to receive love. When we are not receiving money, it means that we're challenged in loving ourselves and we're challenged in bringing love into ourselves. So the, the idea is to start to pay attention to where you spend, where you don't spend, where you feel you're in scarcity, where you feel abundance, and to change your belief system into allowing yourself to receive the abundance of the universe because there's enough abundance for everyone in every corner of the globe. It's a misperception that there's not enough to go around. And when you are accepting abundance and you're allowing yourself to live the way that you choose to live, then you have an overflow of all sorts of abundance to share with others. So it doesn't become something of sacrifice either. It isn't that you need more so that you could give more. Giving more is a byproduct of receiving more. Uh, and that's the basic premise, but the book will allow people to see how to do it, to give you techniques that you follow day by day to day to bring you into that state of feeling and being and thinking and believing in prosperity. Mm, beautiful. Exciting. Well, thank you so much, Karen. Yeah. I really enjoyed this moment and I can't wait to have it online and for people all around the world to to hear and share this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was really wonderful. I appreciate it.